problems and the predicaments and the frustrations and the failures? Or are we going to be able to see from an upper story perspective that God's plan is in motion? God's purposes are at work and we want to have a vision of seeing from the upper story. Forty years before in the nation of Israel, when they got to this very same point, they saw the giants and the size of the armies and the fence cities and they said, we can't do this. And they retreated and they lived in the wilderness for 40 years. They are back there now. It has the same cities. It has the same armies. It has the same giants living in the land. The, you see, folks, you can't run from your problems. They will still be there. So what are you going to do? Wander in a wilderness for 40 years. Are you going to trust the one who made a promise? If you enter the land where over the sole of your foot will trod, I will give it to you. That was going to be their choice. You see, God, from the beginning of the study up to right now, has revealed to us one key thing. And you can write this down if you want to. This is a great way to summarize where we've already been. And that is, from the time that Adam and Eve messed up in the garden, and they wanted to run from God. And people have been running ever since then in this story. God has made the decision to not be a far off God. God has always wanted to draw close to his people. He wanted to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. He wanted to give Noah a fresh start. He wanted to let Abraham and Sarah have a family. God said, I want to be with you. And again and again and again we find God's attempts and encouragements and entreaties to us to be near him. Pieces of the story are peppered with the subject of redemption throughout Scripture. From the sacrifice of the animal to put garments on Adam and Eve to cover their recently discovered nakedness. God has wanted to redeem and restore his people to him. To the flood, he wanted to redeem a fallen creation. With Abraham and Sarah, he wanted to redeem an old couple who were childless and let them become the father of a great nation where God's plans and purposes could be revealed to the rest of the world through them. God was not picking Abraham to be exclusive about him only as a man. God was not developing a nation Israel so that they exclusively would only be his people. God was picking a man of faith to produce a people of faith so that the God of faith could be seen by all the faithless. And that they too could enter in to a relationship with him. One of the other pictures of redemption that we have is the one who was leading the nation of Israel. What's his name? Joshua. Joshua in Hebrew is what in the New Testament? Jesus. Jesus. Same name. Jehovah is salvation. The people are entering the promised land, which is a picture and a foreshadowing. Guys, not of heaven. This is why we take our theology from the Bible and not from our hymns. It's called hymnology if we take it from the, the music book. Theology takes it from the scripture. And there's nothing wrong with some of those beautiful old songs that we love to sing. One that some of you are familiar with, I will not have to cross Jordan alone. That was a great old song about dying and going to heaven. And it's a beautiful song. But folks, the picture of the promised land story is not about our death and going to heaven. The picture of the nation of Israel leaving Egypt and going to the promised land is a picture. See, Paul said in the epistles in the New Testament, these things, referring to the Old Testament, these things were written as an allegory, historically true, but a picture of one thing in the image of another. These things are right on the money. And he said, I want you to learn that Egypt is a picture of people in their sin. You are enslaved by your own sin nature. Jesus Christ comes to bring you out of slavery, to forgive you. Going to the Red Sea, that's a picture of that, all right? The, the last plague, the, the firstborn child dying, all right? The blood on the post prevented death from happening in your life. And so that is a picture of the blood of Jesus Christ over our lives, taking us out of death, bringing us to life, and then going into the land of promise. It's what Jesus said, 
I have come to give you life and life more abundant. I have come to give you what you need to face the challenges and the enemies and the difficult moments of this world with a strength and a courage that is beyond your own resource. It is experience and on a daily basis, peace that passes human understanding, joy beyond human expression, a contentment in spite of the circumstances you're living in. It is about living by faith in the fullness of what God has promised to you. And if you choose to be forgiven of your sin and brought out of Egypt, just as the children of Israel had a choice to make of whether they wanted to enter the promised land, and the first time around they chose no, you can spend years of your Christian life wandering in a wilderness, being miserable and unhappy and wishing to go back to where you once were. But here's what I want you to know. God loves you and me too much to leave us where we once were. Jesus wants to come and be with us. One of the central themes in this book of Joshua is very clearly the idea of courage. And as the people are ready to enter the promised land, God gives them some instructions. He gives them two things that they need to know. I want you to, if you write down things, write these two things down here in just a moment. Because this is how courage is developed in our lives. Courage is not uh, handed to us on a silver platter. This is not a magic wand of spirituality that just presents itself when needed. Courage is a combination of two things. And it's given to the children of Israel in the very beginning of the book of Joshua. In the first 11 chapters, 14 times, God says to the people of Israel, The Lord has given you the land. Is that a future or past tense statement? That's past it. They haven't crossed the river yet. So it's future for their sight. It's future for their experience. But it's past tense in God's provision. God said, this is a done deal. You just have to go claim what already has been accomplished. He said, I promise you, this is going to be waiting for you. I have delivered these people into your hands. He says this 14 times. And then in just a few verses... Uh, in fact, on pages 89 and 90, he says three times, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. Bottom of page 89, top of page 90, that's where you'll find those three quotes. Our relationship with God is not a magic wand religion. It is an active participation in a relationship with God. And there are two things that build and develop courage in our life. The first thing that builds courage in our lives is that we get a vision of the goodness of God. This is where it starts. In order to be courageous, you and I must capture the vision of the goodness of God. Adam and Eve had it as good as you can get, and they messed it up. <laughs> what does God do? The goodness of God prompts him to provide clothing for their nakedness. Though they had sinned against him, he still provided for them. With Noah, he reveals his goodness by bringing him plans on how to build a boat because it's going to rain and how he and his family could be saved and how he could be preaching to the community while he's building the boat and others could be saved. The goodness of God is seen in the story of Abraham and Sarah, an old man and an old woman desirous of having a family, and God says, I will do one better than a family. I will make you the parents of a great nation whose descendants will be as the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. He revealed it in Joseph, whose brothers sold him into slavery, whose slave owner had him thrown into prison, who eventually, through a series of circumstances, rose to the second most influential man in all the country of Egypt, so much so that it not only saved Egypt in a famine, but he saved his own family from a famine. God's goodness was at work. In fact, Joseph recognized it, and he said, what my family intended for evil in my life, God used it for good. God now talks to Moses on the back side of the desert, and he said, Moses, what I wanted to do in your life 40 years before, and you took matters in your own hand, and you postponed what I intended to do, I'm now ready to do with you again. And Moses led the children of Israel out of Egyptian captivity by the goodness of God. And now, 40 years down the road, with Joshua as the new leader, 
God is ready to reveal His goodness again to the children of Israel. You see, 40 years before, the children of Israel could not see the goodness of God for the wickedness of the people who live in the land of Canaan. What is it that blocks your view of God? What is it that distorts your view of who God is? So the first thing in order for you and I to be strong and courageous is we must have a clear vision of the goodness of God. The second thing that we need is difficult circumstances. <laughs> I was hoping that number one was all that we needed. I really was hoping that all we needed was a vision from God. I'm not so sure I want to sign up for number two. You see, the second thing that is required is difficult circumstances. And to figure out what it means to believe and apply the vision of God in these circumstances, God goes on to say, not only be strong and courageous, but he also says, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid. You see, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is, in spite of the fear, I make the right decision. But God is letting us know through the story, be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid. There is a progression that develops here. And there comes a time of spiritual maturity where the things that even though we were, we were courageous enough to face, we're not even fearful to face anymore. If the plane goes out in flames, so be it. If he pulls the trigger, so be it. Paul said, whether I live or whether I die, blessed be the name of the Lord. There came a point in Paul's spiritual development that the things that would often scare him do not scare him anymore. Be strong, be courageous, don't be afraid. So while we're waiting to go over into the promised land, Joshua gives instructions to the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, they have a total of about 40,000 fighting men that are old enough to be soldiers, and he says to them, you'll be our lead fighting force. You'll be the ones to go ahead of everybody else into the promised land. You will initiate the battles that we fight, the land that God has already given to us. You see, there is a participation of willingness on our side to advance into the areas that God would like us to go. And right before they enter the promised land, in Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, that's page 89 of the story. Here's what Joshua has to say. He said, here's the way to go into the land. Do not let the words of this book depart from your mouth. Meditate on them day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be contented and successful. Contentment and success is not about getting a lot of things. It's about entering into the life that God has promised and God is reminding them to keep the words on their lips and in their hearts to turn over every circumstance to the knowledge of God. And then on page 89 and 90, bottom of the page and top of the next, he says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. They were going to inherit the promised land based upon God's presence. So this story that you thought is probably about to come to an end since they were going to arrive where they had been going is really just the beginning of some exciting days for the children of Israel. Even though God has promised them the land, there's going to be a willingness on their part to accept God's promise. For us to apply that to our lives, we have a need to become courageous as we face whatever circumstances come our way. The things that we will face tomorrow when we wake up. We're going to have to have a vision for God about His goodness. And we're going to have to live well within that vision and we face the difficult things in this life. Joshua tells the people of Israel, let's get ready. So the people are poised to enter in and cross over the river. I'm sure that when Joshua sent out two spies, <laughs> Joshua is doing now, 40 years later, what Moses had done 40 years before. He's sending spies into land. How many Moses sent? Well, how many Joshua sinned? You think there's any reason behind that? Do you remember? How many of the 12 spies that Moses sent in came back 
with a report that says, let's go take what's on us. Two. Yeah, two. Ted said, it's a beautiful place. It's everything that God has said. We can believe God halfway. God said it would be wonderful it is. Now, God also said, I'll give it to you. They said, we can't believe that part. The fences are too big. The army's too large. The giant's too big. We can't do this. But Joshua and Caleb, two out of the twelve spies that came back and said, it's everything God said. And since it's everything God said, let's take it just like God said. But the ten melted the heart of people and they responded with fear rather than courage and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Every adult that was the same age as those spies, every adult died in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb. You've got to realize that was a pretty young nation, wasn't it? The only two people who qualified for Medicare was Joshua and Caleb. That's it, all right? Everybody else was much younger than them. But you see, God said, you too, because of your courage, you're still going to wander in the wilderness with the others, but one day you are going to enter the land of promise. So Joshua sent the two spies into this new land. He sent them to the city of Jericho to check things out. All right? <clears throat> and these two guys, when they get to the city of Jericho, do you know where their first stop is? <laughs> they stop at a hooker's house. What's her name? Rahab. Can you believe it? Two guys going to a new land, brand new city, and the first place they stop is a house of prostitution. Now, there's probably a reason for that. According to historians, those type of businesses, the three top things for running their business was location, location, location. And so they were situated, all right, as a quick entrance and exit to the city. And so it's not unusual they would find themselves going there, all right? And so they meet, they meet Rahab as soon as they get there. And listen to what Rahab says to the two spies of the Israelites. This is on page 91 of the story. She says, here's what the people of my town already know about you and your God. That everyone's courage in our town is failing, for the Lord your God is the God in heaven above and on the earth below. Do you think she was becoming a believer? Holy smokes, I think so. So Rahab, she knows how to make a deal. That's her business. <laughs> but more than it being her business, what she has heard about the God of Israel has melted her heart. And so she says, guys, here's the deal. I'll keep the keen soldiers from finding you because they have heard the people are here and they're looking to capture and kill you. I will misdirect the king's men. I will give you safety if you will save my life and the life of my family. Wow. Is this not what God wanted from the very beginning of time? Isn't this what God wanted when he said, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation? Not because I'm going to show favoritism to you as a man, Abraham, and not because I'm going to show favoritism to Israel as a nation, but Abraham, I'm choosing you because of faith, and out of your descendants, I want a nation of faith. For what purpose? So that all the other nations of the world will know that I am God. And here's Rahab. She's believing in the God of Abraham. First, first city, first convert. This is the first Gentile to become part of the lineage of God. They make an agreement. And what do the spies tell Rahab? Get your family under your roof. Put the scarlet thread in your window. If your family is outside of that scarlet thread, they will not be saved. If you want them saved, put them under the scarlet thread. Is that not a picture of God drawing near to us? Is that not a picture of what God did on the cross? He said, the blood of my son will be shed there. If you want to be saved, put yourself under his blood and you will be saved. It's a beautiful, beautiful Old Testament picture of what would happen thousands of years later. So these two spies, guess how many days they spend on the hillside? Three days. Any significance? Uh, probably so. The spies go back to Joshua. Here's their report. 
The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us and our God. Our reputation, the reputation of God, has gone before us. We can easily conquer these people. You all have heard the expression, what a difference a day makes? How about what a difference 40 years makes? There's unity in the report of the spies. Let's go. Let's take. Let's possess. Joshua gives the order to everybody to get ready to cross the Jordan River. The river at this particular time is at flood stage. It's harvest time. The river would normally be 12 to 15 feet higher than normal. And Joshua said, here's the deal. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to take the Ark of the Covenant, which is the symbol of the presence of God for our people since we've been wandering in the wilderness, and our priests are going to carry it on their shoulders with the poles as instructed, and they are going to walk out into the middle of the river. And as soon as our, our priests have the Ark of the Covenant into the river, God says he's going to make the river stand up. It will be cut off the same way we were saved when we left Egypt. It will be the way that we enter into the promised land. There is a New Testament passage, folks. Remember, the Old Testament is given for a reason that we can learn from the New Testament. The New Testament says, just as you began your Christian life, so continue. How do we begin? For by grace are you saved <laughs> through faith. The children of Israel were brought out of Egypt by faith in the power of God and across the Red Sea. The same way they crossed the Red Sea will be the same way they will enter in to the good of what God promised years before. You and I move from salvation into abundant Christian life in the same way, by faith and by faith. God revealed it by doing the very same thing at the Red Sea as he did at the Jordan River. And then Joshua told one person from each of the 12 tribes of Israel as they crossed over the river for them to pick up a rock. Remember, what, what were those rocks called last week? Man. Ebenezer. 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 Good. One of you remembered. <laughs> Ebenezer. All right. We've been talking about singing that song. I raised my Ebenezer. All right. One day, I, you, you raise the rock, the stone. Scripture says, if you we lift up Jesus Christ, we'll draw all men into him. Upon this rock, what rock? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But each of these men were to pick up a rock and, and take those Ebenezers and make an altar, and it was going to be called Gilgal. Gilgal. In Gilgal, four things happened that significantly reflect the children of Israel celebrating and remembering what has happened and what's about to happen. First of the four things they did was they built an altar. The stones were to be there as a reminder in the future of what God had done in their present and in their past. Gilgal, a place to remember. If you ever want a better way to think about a cemetery, think about it as a Gilgal. You go and you look at the headstone of someone that you love. You remember the way in which they touched your life. And you have hope that this is not all there is. They had just crossed the Jordan, but it wasn't just across Jordan that was going to be the promised land. They were going to advance deeper into the land. There was so much more for them. There was so much more for those who died in faith because God has promised us a blood life. Second of all, probably a little less popular than building an altar to remember, is this was known as the phase of cutting the flesh. You see, between 670 and 720,000 men had been born in the wilderness, and they had not been circumcised. And that was part of the covenant between God and Abraham, that all of his descendant men would be circumcised as a reflection of that covenant. And so now, there's over around 700,000 men going through adult circumcision. I figured more of you would groan. <laughs> And the story says on page 92, there was great pain in the camp. That's probably the understatement of all the Bible. It also says that for the next few days, the only able-bodied people in the camp were women. And that may have been true for years after that anyway. In Genesis chapter 17, when circumcision was first offered as a sign of the covenant, that phrase was used by God to his people, that this is my covenant in your flesh. 
It was a tangible marking of our bodies to remember the covenant that we had with God. Now, here's the thing I struggled with for years. Why did God pick circumcision as the sign of this covenant with Him? I mean, who else is going to know that you're circumcised? I mean, did Jewish men go around flashing their toga open? Look, i got a covenant relationship with God. <laughs> of course they didn't. They would have been stoned had they done that. You see, it wasn't to be as an outward physical sign for others. This was for the man and God to know that they had a Bible relationship with each other. And here's the other deal. The only other person that really would have known, apart once the parents had done it, was his spouse. And marriage is the visible picture of what a relationship that you and I are to have with God the Father. So, build an altar, cut the flesh. The third thing is, they were going to celebrate the Passover. That Passover feast had not been celebrated for 40 years since they left Egypt. Their wilderness wanderings, they ignored that celebration of the Passover. So as they enter this new place and phase in life, God says, remember the past. Don't ever forget your salvation. Don't ever forget your deliverance. And then fourth, the manna stops. The period of manna is over. That bread-like substance that God used to sustain the children of Israel in the desert is now finished. It has ceased. The first day they enter the promised land, the man has stopped. Why? Because the new provision is you are going to eat off the fat of this land. There are fruits and vegetables and resources here. You're never going to need dull, boring manna ever, ever again. So that's what happened to Gilgal. Very significant place. Now, the first battle that they're going to face is the battle where? Jericho. Jericho. Songs have been written about that. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. Jericho. And the walls come tumbling down. Wow. The spies report that Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. The people of Jericho knew that the spies had gotten in. They heard about this dry land crossing over the Jordan. They were, they were drawn up like a tight drum. Uh, they didn't want anything getting in. We often treat God that way, don't we? We know He's coming our direction. And we fortify our life to keep God out. See, Joshua is now going to become a battle strategician. But he knows enough from previous experience that he should pray before he goes to battle. So he prays for God to give him direction how to win the battle of Jericho. Joshua is stunned with the marching orders. This, he expected God to lay out this great strategic battle plan. And God says, I want you to take the nation of Israel. And I want you to walk around the city once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, I want you to walk around the city seven times. And then I want you all to shout. Is that a battle plan that you would have great confidence in? <laughs> Joshua did. Joshua did. He might not have liked it, but Joshua did. I thought long and hard over the years, and it wasn't until I was preparing for today that it kind of dawned on me. What had already happened with one of the citizens of Jericho? It was the burden. Now, for six days, a revival sermon is preached every single day. They walk around the city every day. Jericho has a chance to see the might and the power and the influence of God and his people. God would have just as soon redeemed the whole city as well as just bring out the prostitute. But for six days, those people fortify and fortify, resist and resist. And on the seventh day, he gives them seven times. Seven, seven times. At any point, I think the folks could have waved the white flag and God would have been so pleased. God wants to draw people just as rain happens. God would have rather taken it by love than violence. And he gave them a chance. And none except Rahab responded. But all those under the scarlet threat protection of Rahab's family, they were saved. 
Rahab got saved. Jericho is defeated and destroyed. Rahab is that very first Gentile grafted into the tribe of Israel. That, that's Jericho. And so much more could be said about Jericho. And let me just make one other observation, and that's this. Jericho, the reason that was the first battle is because they were the strategic location. Because they controlled the way of ascent that went into the land. Whatever came in and went out had to go to Jericho. Doesn't that sound like our will? Whatever comes in or is denied or goes out of our life has to be the center of our will. And the walls of our will must come tumbling down under the influence of God before he has full access to our life. The second battle, where was it? Yeah, AI, right? However you want to say it. Hey! Hey! Anyway, little town called AI. Whoa, what happened? They won Jericho. What happened to the AI? They got beat. Ooh, why? This is big. Because AI wasn't big. Jericho was big. AI wasn't. Jericho, J E R I C A. Seven letters. AI, two. All right, just the just number of letters. Big little, okay? But you see, here's what happened. The people saw AI, and they said, God, take the day off. We can handle this. That's what they said. They didn't pray before they did that. They prayed and sought God's counsel before they fought Jericho. They did not before they sought and fought AI. You see, self-confidence rather than godly confidence. They forgot God. They didn't pray. They forgot God's plan. And then third of all, there was disobedience in the camp. You see, God had told, God had told Israel, when Jericho was defeated, I do not want you to take any plunder. Do not take their silver. Do not take their gold. Do not take their bronze. Do not take their possessions. Do not take anything. Why? Because God wanted the people who lived there to understand the nation of Israel was different. You see, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 12, I believe it is, or chapter 22, it talks about how in the spring the kings go off to war. You understand that in the land of Canaan, at that time of life and living, they had a season, like we have a season for football and for baseball and for basketball, they had a season for war. Every spring, they went off to war, and what would they do? They would raid other people and take their stuff. It was the way they made their living. And God says, I want you all to know, I will provide for you. You do not need to steal from others. Don't take anything that belongs to them. And during the first battle of Jericho, there was a man named Achan. Achan or Achan, either way, all right? And he stole some stuff. And he hid it in his tent. And so you have the nation as a whole forgetting God by self-confidence. They forgot God's plan and they didn't pray. And besides that, there was someone in the camp who has not obeyed God's principles. Anybody have a glove with them in here? Anybody have a glove? Should have, should have made David stay for all three services. I forgot to get a glove. You got a glove? Well, let me see your glove. Please see your glove. And while I'm getting this glove, when somebody turn the heater off, here's the principle. See? The victory of God in Jericho did not improve the street ability of the Israelites. Why not? Because it wasn't their strength that defeated Jericho, it was God's. Glove? Slap Milo. It ain't working. Uh, <laughs> all right. See, here's the deal. Now, okay. It's had practice now. It did it twice. Glove, slap me low. See, the fact that it already done it twice doesn't give it any more strength to do it again. You see, I, this probably doesn't fit in my hand. This is so much more dainty than I am. Okay. You see, in order for this glove to have life, it needs my hand in the glove. 
And the same thing is true in the Christian life. Spiritual victories in our life do not make us any stronger for the next event we're going to face. What it should teach us is maturity, not strength. And maturity is remembering, I can't, he never said I could, he can, he always said he would. It's always his strength that brings about every victory as proved to us in Jericho and Ai. The fact that they wanted Jericho and lost in Ai was evident that it wasn't about the people, it was about their God. And so it takes God in the people to bring about his victories, and it takes God in us to bring about the abundant life that he says is yours and mine as we live in faith with him. I should have worked out more this week. Okay. Let's, let's, let's wrap this up. You get to page 99 in the book. And it says, Then the land had rest from war. All the fight was now over. Now, let's remember. Did the nation of Israel fully obey the commands of God in securing the land of Israel? No. If people, if people repented... They became part of the nation of Israel. If people repent today, they to become part of God's family. They were told for those who didn't to utterly destroy them. And that sounds cruel and horrible and vicious. But we're going to find out in the book of Judges what happens to the nation of Israel because they didn't fully follow that command. But for a period of time, under Joshua's leadership, they now have rest from the Lord. And Joshua divides up the land. He gives gives every tribe of Israel their section of land, and then the leader of every tribe divided that land up with all of the heads of households of that tribe. Joshua comes to Caleb. There is a special gift for Caleb. Can you see these two best friends? Only two of their generation. Nobody else around it really understands what had happened 40 years ago. Joshua looks at Caleb and says, buddy, what do you want? God made a promise. Whatever you want when we get here, it's yours. What do you want? Do you, do you know what Caleb picked? Caleb did not pick the choicest piece of land that would be the easiest to take and to hold on to. Joshua takes Hebron. It's a special place, but it's a mountainous place. It is a difficult, the worst fighting enemies were on that place. And do you know what this old man had the audacity to say? He said, I am as strong today, which is now 45 years later than when I was here before. I am as able today to do now what I could have done then. And in the 21st century vernacular, I'm going to kick their butts. Give me Hebron. And he does. And he came, came. You see, I think for you and me, this tells us, this gives us a great picture of what it means to grow old and well with God. We'll not only be strong and courageous, but we will not be afraid. Caleb was not afraid to face those dangers anymore. This book, the book of Joshua, ends the same way it began. Joshua giving to the people of Israel the same direction. Be strong and be courageous. And for a period of time, the land had rest for war. I'll be honest with you. If the Old Testament ended right here, I would be really happy. One of the things I find absolutely incredible about God is He doesn't keep the blemishes out of His history away from us. He could have easily kept the blemishes out, and made us think, hey, this is an easy thing. But he didn't. If you haven't started reading chapter, uh, chapter 8 yet, let me, uh, it's called A Few Good Men and Women. Third paragraph opens this way, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served the Baals of other nations. Page 104, the second page, yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Last paragraph, the second page, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Two paragraphs later, and again, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. The land had rest from war, but Israel did not have rest 
from their own wickedness. And we're going to discover some principles about how God, even when his own children choose not to be near to him, how he pursues them and us today. I want to close with a declaration, if we can, this morning. When Joshua opened up the book of Joshua, as he got ready to launch into the land of Canaan, Joshua made a profession to all of the people who were present. And he said, but as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. If that is the desire of your heart, would you repeat that entire sentence with me? And let me quote it to you one more time. And you can think about this. If this is the desire of your heart, I'm going to ask you to make this public declaration out loud with me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you're ready to do that, would you say it out loud with me? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Father, just as the walls of Jericho in those first steps into the land of promise could not prevail against the Israelites, the New Testament tells us that the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. So I pray that we as members of your church can say let the battles begin. That with the strength of God at work in our lives, your hand in our glove, your life in dwelling our spirits, we will face the battles joyously, willfully, so that all the promises you offer to us, we will live in the reality of those promises. Just as Israel had to face many, many enemies, the Hittites, the Hittites, the Gershites, the Jebusites, we have enemies of our own to face today. We have selfishness. We have control. We have a lack of faith. We have the battles over our own desires versus your leadership in our lives. But you tell us those battles have already been won. Just as you had given that land to Israel before they ever set foot on it, you have given to us a quality of life that is waiting for us to experience and enjoy. Give us the knowledge to know how to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, have a great day and a wonderful afternoon. See you.